My name is Jess. I'm the head of professional services here at Fishtown. And you might be thinking we have a, or Fishtown has a professional services team. We do. What exactly do we do? So the gist of what we do is help companies get set up on modern analytics stacks, whether that is migrating from the stack that they're currently on to a more modern setup or setting it up from scratch. That's kind of the gist of what we do. That always includes some, some work in DBT, whether that is auditing an existing DBT project. So maybe the client has done some work and they want us to come in and help them with some best practices or building out a DBT project from scratch. That's, that's always part of what we do. And then also we train these analytics teams that we're working with how to use DBT and we share the best practices that we've developed over time through working with, working with various and many clients. So next slide. So we're not, we are definitely not trying to sell you on these services that we, that we offer. If you are interested, we, we can talk about it, but that's not the purpose of what we are doing here today. What we're hoping to do is just talk through the way we work with clients and the types of things that we encounter, and then how we think about problem solving stemming from these engagements that we're involved in. So this, this graphic here kind of shows the cycle of generating, generating new knowledge, whether that's in the form of maybe a playbook or an article that we've written that you've read on the Fishdown blog, DBT blog, and discourse, typically starts off with an engagement with a client. So like I said, it, that could either be a brand new analytics stack from scratch or migrating their old stack to a new stack. And throughout that process, the client may ask us something that we have never been asked before. It's a new problem that we've never encountered. And so that gets our wheels turning and we start thinking, all right, is this something um, that people have asked before? If no, what's the best way to solve this problem? And then maybe that goes through a couple of iterations of this. So we've got some baseline knowledge for whatever this problem is. Maybe it's a new marketing problem or a web session problem. And we've got some ways that we're thinking about this. And then we come across that problem again. Maybe we iterate on this, this methodology that we've developed. And so you can see how this cycle, you know, working across really many tools in the stack. So coming across new problems with different tools, with different companies, um, we've got inputs from all these different areas. So we feel like we're, we're pretty uniquely positioned to, to develop some knowledge on these topics. So. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that Jess just shared and, and go in depth a little bit so that you guys all have an idea of where, where we're really thinking this could go. So Jess mentioned marketing attribution. I'm not sure how many of you have uh, kind of taken a look at Claire's attribution post. There is a blog post that really goes through a lot of our thinking around how our team has solved attribution, first touch, last touch, multi-touch. It really gives a lot of context. It talks about what data you actually need in order to use uh, this playbook, gather your required data sources, you know, going into actually getting the conversions into place and, and having your sessions available. And it shares code in this blog post, but there is also an associated repository um, where you can actually work through the models in this project and use them as examples as you look to solve this problem yourself. This concept of like open sourcing analytics isn't super common to a lot of people. Um, and it's something that we care a lot about. Again, as just mentioned, we come across these issues over and over again in our engagements with customers here at Fishtown Analytics. And so as we see patterns and how they can be solved, we very much have these light bulbs go off in our head like, hey, this probably matters to 10 or 1,000 or 10,000 other analysts out there. Why don't we try to write this up and kind of get our learnings out into the ether so that this can you know, hopefully get you from question to answer more quickly the next time you have the problem. So that's attribution. We also have a playbook that Claire created on MRR. This is another um, very common thing that we've come across in terms of taking a bunch of different payment and subscriptions and getting them into the format of one row per month per account so that you can very easily create a dashboard like the one that she shares here, right? So what, you know, how many active customers do we currently have? What is our MRR? Making sure that you amortize that data if you have annual subscriptions and you want to see it monthly and all of those different pieces. So again, this playbook really goes into detail how we've thought about this problem, why we've solved it in the way that we have with an associated playbook, sorry, an associated repository. So you can very much work through this. You can see all of the models that go into it and actually test this out, right? Again, having a question, getting to an answer more quickly, hopefully using some of the models in here 
to understand how to answer this question and, and see how we've done this for other customers. And packages are another example of this. Jess, you want to talk about snowplow? Yeah, snowplow is a really interesting. So um, modeling snowplow data, I'm not sure how many of you have done that, but tracking web data. We use Snowplow internally. We implemented Snowplow for a number of customers. And we found that the, the modeling that needs to be done to go from a single events table, ultimately to a final Snowplow sessions model that you see here, that's a lot of modeling work and it's a lot of complex modeling work. But the cool thing is it looks very similar regardless of, of who the client is. And so that's a perfect opportunity for a package code that's repeated um, across multiple customers solves a very similar problem. So Aaron's got a shot of the repo and then yeah what the output of that model looks like or the output of that package looks like looks like as well and and we've had a lot of questions and comments from like when is a package the right way to do this right like could could claire have made a package for mrr reporting or attribution and in those cases oftentimes the answer is no there are going to be intricacies to solving that problem that are relevant to you but not other people and so having a set of models that build into your project is likely not the right way to go and instead as much as we all hate to say this internally copy pasting kind of from these repositories into your project and altering them so that they're relevant for your company um, is usually the best way to go another example of a package that could be really useful is something like zendesk right if you have uh, ticketing data that comes in and you're syncing it to your warehouse via Stitch or Fivetran, the output of those models or of those tables is going to look the same, right? You're going to have a tags table, you're going to have a tickets table, and you're going to relate the two of those together to understand how your tickets have been tagged. Whereas something like Salesforce, as much as uh, we would all love to have a package for that, has a ton of customizations to it. And so it's likely not something that many people can just plug and play with because people use Salesforce differently. They have a ton of custom fields. And so probably not the best uh, use case for a package there. Let me get this back into presentation mode. Okay, great. So why do we kind of like give the context that we just gave? Where, where are we actually trying to get to? So when we started to plan Coalesce at the end of last year to happen in May, our head of marketing, Janessa, and I had this conversation of, you know, can we have a, a concept of like asking the experts? How can we get the professional services team to help people solve really challenging problems? And our first thought was, why don't we have kind of like a speed dating interaction where people can book 15 minute time slots with professional services they can ask their really hard questions. Professional services can give them some answers. This isn't really going to be super helpful because uh, you guys are all super smart in the community. You ask incredible questions. And so a lot of these problems are probably not things that we can help you solve in 15 minutes. They're going to be the thing where you've presented, hey, I have this challenging problem. And then we're going to say, hmm, we're going to have to think about that. And so in thinking through how to best run and ask the experts, we figured that we would start with the community. We have a few months before Coalesce actually happens. And so we want to brainstorm with you all. Yeah, so we, if we were super selfish, we've got a ton of ideas floating around in Google Docs and Trello boards and GitHub issues and all sorts of places, things that we have come across and said, hey, we should, we should work on this at some point. But, you know, we wanted to pull the community. So I thought it's kind of hard to, to just start thinking about this right away. So I wanted to have a couple of our analytics engineers talk about some of the things they have been thinking about that kind of fit this mold of what we're talking about. Sanjana and Chris, either one of you wanna talk through some of the PII stuff that you all have been working on and just the way you're thinking about developing a solution for that? Yeah, I could talk a little bit about that. Cool. Yeah, as we develop, as uh, the world develops uh, new standards for PII data privacy and giving the ownership of your data back to who, who it's about. Uh, there are new laws such as GDPR, which has been around for a little while, and CCPA, which has been around for a very short amount of time and is, as I think a lot of people would agree, very loosely defined. So the things that we know that we have to take into consideration, um, especially as we move our data from our uh, internal sources into warehouses, is that not only is our data getting scrubbed from the original uh, place 
when we get when a company gets these strike requests, but it's also getting removed from your data warehouse and any third party vendors. This has presented an issue for um, a lot of people because PI data is so spread out amongst um, all of your different vendors. There's a bunch of different places in the warehouse. And as far as I can tell at this point, there's a whole lot of manual finding of where all of this uh, information is kept, specific columns of tables, but using a DBT macro centric approach with a run operation, you can process strike requests in that type of fashion to ensure that all of the pre-identified fields have been anonymized and you're still able to maintain the connections between your different systems as your uh, DPT project executes. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, so a broad problem and we're thinking about how could we solve that with DBT and how could we provide a solution that is hopefully as universal as possible that works for, for most people in PII type situations. Andrew, do you want to chat about your DBT helper? that you've worked on? Uh, I got a bit. So DBT Helper is a package uh, by Michael Kaminsky, who's written a blog post about analytics engineering and all the other fun stuff. We've gotten it to a place where it works with 0 0.17 and also 0 0.18 recently. So it might be good to look at and interesting to peek at. And that's more like things you can hack together with DBT core and kind of play around with. So that's like one space where it's like, do we build automated workflows? For now, it's like, this is super unreliable. Let's try it out with DBT Helper. And if it breaks, well, it kind of breaks. Sorry. Um, but we're still thinking about like ways to make that reliable. That's more like a side project. The other thing that I was thinking about chatting with, or like uh, just another broad problem is, especially with things like Salesforce, where everything's super custom, a super common problem when you have history tracking in Salesforce are things happening at the exact same millisecond. So I've like seen this a couple of times over and over. The hardest part is figuring out like what's actually causing it. And so the, the normal answer is we should stop the things that's causing like changes at the exact same millisecond, but nobody really knows a quick answer for that. So instead we work towards like finding a way to properly order the history so that you can try to take advantage of Salesforce tracking last value and current value in their history tracking and try to replicate the order even if your changes happen down to the same millisecond. I don't have a very good answer to that. We're figuring out also like, is that something we should be abstracting out and have like a macro pre-built ready to go and just be like, if this is a Salesforce history table, it will refix the order for you. Quite unclear, quite unsure. Awesome, thanks Andrew. Eric, do we have time for one more example or do you wanna move on to the next? Yeah, I think let's do one more and then we can open it up for conversation. Okay, cool. Sanjana, do you wanna talk about the data science topic that you chatted about? Sure, I think in the past and actually at present, we've been really good at drawing the lines regarding what DVT is good at and what DVT is not. Historically, we've, we've seen DBT tables created by DBT used to power ML models, but we're also interested to see what kind of intersections people are finding. Is there, for example, is there any analyses that you usually think of that's more a machine learning kind of anal analysis, but makes sense to do in SQL and we have good reason to think that it's, probably, it's better served in DBT? An example of that is something that Chris actually worked on around like customer segmentation. We talked a little bit of, we talked a little bit this morning as a team around analyzing test results, A B test results in DBT. So any kind of intersection of those two areas that I that actually makes a lot more a lot of sense would be super interesting to learn about. Awesome. Thank you. Amazing. So our hope is that those are helpful as we look to actually brainstorm together. So we haven't done this type of structure in the past. I know Claire very regularly has people chatting in the, in the thread here. So if you feel more comfortable putting some ideas that you've been thinking about in the thread, we can definitely kind of have people start the conversation there. Or as we see some of those come in, I'll probably ask you to unmute yourself and maybe go into detail a little bit more about that problem. What I'm hoping for is in about 15 minutes or so, we can take a pause and I'm gonna send out a survey to everybody. It's a little bit less of a survey and a little bit more of an intake form um, where you can put your name and the topic that you talked about. 
and then collectively as a group we'll actually vote on these so we can narrow these down to to a few different options we're thinking three that we can then take and between now and december as a group our professional services team will work with the people who have come up with these topics to get to an answer to this question it might be a playbook as we've talked about it might be a package it might be a discourse post um, maybe it's a macro that we add to DVT utils who knows so i would love to open up the floor um, and see what questions you all came uh, looking to answer don't all jump at once I'm really good at waiting in silence, so just kidding. We have a few more ideas that our team has been thinking about. And we're happy to kind of keep going. Tegan, plus one for the PII discussion. Great, good to hear. Something that I have thought a little bit about, we have very regularly created metrics tables in DBT for customers. Almost always the end result of a, a factor, a DIM model, are fairly granular um, so that you can really aggregate and do what you need to at the BI layer. But there are really useful reasons why you would wanna do those aggregations in DBT to create you know, one row per metric so that you can easily see you know, what's the rolling seven day average of these uh, values. And so in the past, we've kind of created the structure in which maybe a macro sets how those metrics could get built into the metrics table. I mean, that's something that I think might live really well as either a playbook or a package as we've kind of looked into this. All right, Joel, reproducibility of results over the long term without having to snapshot the entire upstream DAG. Mm, also dealing with deduping multiple snapshots in a day, getting the inequality join right is, yes, very challenging. And that actually goes back a little bit to what Andrew was talking about when things come in at the same millisecond, but a little bit of a different issue. Joel, do you want to unmute yourself and, and kind of talk about maybe a little bit more specific about that problem? Yeah, so one thing that we've, basically the first thing we did in DBT and mode was a dashboard for how many, how many schools are using EP at the moment, how many students and how many departments. And we've got a very pretty uh, dashboard for what is right now but then the ceo was like well why can't we see what it was last week and we were like well we could but it's really hard and we don't really want to do that work and so what because we originally were like oh that's fine we've got we can just take snapshots of everything and read but like i re read the post it's like oh snapshot all of your sources and then you can reconstruct anything from first principles but it turns out that to get that was like a dozen tables and I didn't really want to have to snatch up all of those, deal with their cross table relationships because it was very normalized on the source data. And so what we wound up doing was snapshotting the final output table then, but that still, we had to then fan back out against the date spine because it was SCD2. And so it was all just like a little bit fiddlier than I would have liked. Yeah. We, we were actually talking about something fairly similar-ish this morning when we were brainstorming what ideas we need to talk about on this call. And, and Chris on the Fishtown side had a very similar issue that he's dealt with across a few different clients that are kind of similar. And so I think that this is a, a really good and hard problem to solve and one that I would love to dig into more. Yeah, I've wound up writing a macro for our side that's just like called calendar fan or something and it assumes that you're passing in a calendar model and doing dbt valid from dbt valid to and it just deals with it all but that's like one little itsy bitsy piece of the puzzle so yeah and then you find yourself like are you snapshotting every single time you do a dbt run and then you have all like, this massive table of all the changes and you really care about kind of like either the beginning of the day or the end of the day and then how do you choose that yeah, because yeah, what, what we would have done in the olden days before we had a warehouse was just we had a SQL agent job that ran once a day and outputted the calculated results and then that was sort of 
that was like ideal from the state of, well, it, it's going to happen pretty much once a day. It probably won't happen twice a day. And you can then, you, you just have it all out of, but this as well as like better arguably, but it's more work to get there. Mm -hmm. Even, even snapshotting the final, the final model once all the processing's done. Yeah. And Josh gave a plus one to this one. So it seems like people are loving this idea as a concept too. All right. What other questions did people come with? I had a quick question to maybe unpack the snapshots thing a bit. I think Josh, your question looks like slightly related, but also slightly tangentially different. I've always envisioned snapshots as like, as much as like we, I believe this was the initial um, intention. I think it's kind of slightly morph where we treat snapshots more like a stopgap solution until you get proper, you know, event log tracking, or like you could work with your product team to try to get better tracking around like a particular variable that's important. But it seems like there's a lot of other cases where you really can't budge and you really have to rely on snapshots. A good example is like Salesforce where some tables just won't have native tracking and there's no way to get around it. Did you have, you want to offer a bit more context to this one, Josh, as to like when you say DAG aware, is this like given a certain condition, you're going to trigger your snapshot and try to capture that data because of conditions that happen in the DAG? Or is this more just like properly scheduling it where it's not independent from certain model runs as it is sure. today? Sure, yeah. So so first of all, the, I want to respond to your comment about snapshots as a stopgap solution. I, I think... I think one of the interesting things that I've seen in the DBT community is that there are different groups of people who have exposure and usage for very different kinds of data sources and very different kinds of scenarios. You've listed data sources that are more, for the most part, unstructured or semi-structured when you talk about event logging or other things like that. At the firm I work for, we tend to deal a lot with data sources like relational databases. We have Oracle sources, we have and then, you know, we're using a loader to load them into like Snowflake or BigQuery or something like that, or Postgres or other things. And we also have Salesforce, or we also have data sources like Salesforce and, and event logging and so on. But in the cases where you're dealing with the relational database systems or systems that sort of masquerade, like you're calling an API and maybe you're not getting a direct export or SQL access, but you're calling an API and you're getting stuff out that looks like a real table and not just a stream of events per se. You know, we will run into a lot of scenarios where it's not possible to get true, reliable change data capture off the sources. We we don't have access to the backend database engine. We don't have access to log miner or in SQL Server. We don't have access, or the DBA team won't turn on the facilities to enable actually the 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 true CDC kinds of tracking. Or we don't have access to what is it the wall, the right ahead log, and like all those those backend things, which is not just select star from. It's like you have to have some level of administrative access to the server. And the source application is not tracking updates to the data either at the app. Like, it's not like, oh, they write an audit log in the database. And so in those scenarios, having snapshotting to at least be able to say like every hour, every two hours, here is the state of the source data and capture the changes is, is invaluable. So in those scenarios, like in all these scenarios, snapshots, and I agree with you, they were originally envisioned, I, I believe by the DBT, team as or the Fishtown team is you're doing change capture or it's a, it's a batch the documentation literally says it's a batch oriented approach for, for CDC right but as we've we've started getting into working a lot with DBT and and you know I, I know a couple of the other folks on this call have spoken about like you start wanting to do things like hey I also want to capture the state of my downstream or my output model models at given points in time and one of the lovely features of DBT is this whole idea of item potency and drop and rewrite everything every time if you don't think too much about incrementals models but the challenge of that is it's a double-edged sword now i dropped it i don't know i don't know what things were before particularly when you're getting into financial modeling or predictions or whatever everybody's brain sort of blows up when it's like wait what do you mean it changed since yesterday but you can't tell me how it changed now sometimes the response to that is well, just be more careful about tracking your code changes. But what, from what we've seen, when you get to a sufficient point of complexity in a DBT project, 
you almost have to start treating the change of your own code over time as like a black box in a certain way. You have to say like, I can't know over the last two weeks, it's just impossible for me to, to actually go back and try and retroactively understand exactly how my code changes change to the data. You know what, I should just capture what the data looked like in the past and, and sort of automate that process. Well, what we're running into now as we start to do that is, oh, so we have some snapshots we run on our sources, and then we have some models from those snapshots. And then we have other snapshots on those models. And now we're getting to the point where we need models on the second rounds of snapshots. And pretty soon, I'm sure we're going to need more snapshots after that. And we're doing sort of janky orchestration with this via tagging. But it's, it's, it's not that it's not just not elegant. It's like it's, it's starting to become very confusing and difficult. And, and, and if the snapshots were just fully DAG aware, like this, would, this whole problem would go away. And it kind of makes conceptual sense. They're a node in the DAG, right? Why wouldn't I understand all the coding issues and the complexity? And I'm very grateful for all the team does. So don't interpret it as a complaint. I'm just saying conceptually, the more you look at it, it's like, oh, if it was just a node in the DAG and acted as one, this whole thing would, a lot of this problem would become a lot simpler. No, that's super, super helpful context. I feel like it's one of the different ways that projects mature mm -hmm. in the sense where like, some projects will start to rely on these arbitrary pieces because you had such a complicated DAG prior that there's really no other way to, to orchestrate it. And in your case, yeah, we do end up with crazy tagging that is tricky and very, un yeah. you know, I might say, yeah, yeah. Okay, super, super helpful. Yeah, love it. Um, Unfortunately, no good answer yet. Yeah, and Joel kind of had a feedback on that as well. And, and I agree, I think, having that change then creates another question, right? Okay, so now you know that two weeks ago, our revenue was showing $1,000 and now it's showing 998. Like where did that $2 go, right? And so then it's, it's understanding how to also then like test that change and like show where it's coming from that I think is an even deeper layer of this. Felipe asked a great question that, you know, his team is starting to use DBT and big fan of macros, but afraid that if he uses macros extensively, they might lose a bit of the benefit of only needing SQL knowledge to work on DBT. Any suggestions, what sort of guidance uh, to give on using macros? A lot of the professional services team members were just all shaking their head. This is something that we as a team have even seen, right? Everybody starts, they learn the DBT way, they get access to macros and they just get so excited. Let me make the most macros ever. And then it's very challenging to jump in. So this is something that we talk about in DBT Learn. A lot of, of just, yes, you might be able to create a macro for this, but if it saves you a few lines of code, but is a lot more challenging for the rest of your team to jump in and make changes, that trade-off is likely not where you want to go. Let me see another thing just came in. Grant. Another good thing to add to that, Aaron, which again, not a good answer, but I think definitely another thing we should look into a bit more with the whole concept of like the trade-offs of macros. Feature which sometimes gets thrown under or hidden in the weeds is um, no documentation for macros now. So if you can get your team to be heavy on like the doc site, we now have a way to show you where the macros is being, where the macro is being called in all the different models and vice, sort of vice versa. Not a very good answer, um, but if that's not something your team's heavily using, could be a good way to introduce them slowly. So it is less SQL heavy, but more like, at least they can try to catch themselves up to speed ish, but definitely more thinking around it. I was just gonna add on that like, I, it is also highly like team dynamic dependent where uh, you could have, a, depending on the size of your, your data team, if you have a couple people who are very comfortable with like creating macros, as long as like it's well documented and there are people that can't create macros, they still might be able to use the macros that other people are creating. So I think it's highly team dependent and like what resources you have available are the resources that you can really use. So as long as like a macro is easy enough to implement and well, well designed by the whoever's writing it, I think that it's more widely applicable and doesn't really hire the bar of like just knowing SQL because it should be a simple enough concept that uh, it's just a couple curly brackets that you haven't seen before. <laughs> yeah, it's when you start to get into the models that are just entirely brackets and there's like not even a single line of SQL and then you're like, hmm, let me work, look through the macros 
that have been written and understand like, okay, well, this one's pulling in this one, which is, and then you, you just know that you've gotten too deep into it. Let's see what else has come in. So Grant links to a discourse post. Yes, I was thinking that that one too, Grant, about snapshots to detect regressions. Tegan, this looks like a question around, should change data capture be in the domain of DBT or not? Yeah, it's a wonderful question. I think, you know, this, this comes up fairly regularly. It's come up now like two or three times on this call. And so I think understanding how to deal with this is exactly the type of like open-ended kind of hard challenging question that I was looking to get into um, with this group today. Because yes, something might turn into a playbook or something might turn into a package, but it also might just be a discourse post that says, hey, this is what our recommendations are when you're looking for change data capture, right? And these are like the different scenarios that might make sense based on the different problems that you're trying to solve with this. So that's excellent. Um, okay, I'm gonna pause for questions really quickly and send over a link in the chat. This is just gonna ask for your name and a quick explanation of your data challenge. This is all going to populate into a spreadsheet so that we can use that to pull the crowd and have people actually vote on these. So if you have presented, oh gosh, needs permission, give me one second. Okay, try now. Sorry about that. Can I get a thumbs up if it worked for someone outside of Fishtown? Yes, good, great, thank you. Didn't realize there was a Fishtown only link on there. Great, so if uh, everyone wants to take a few minutes to fill that out with the things that they've thought of, if you have been quiet and you have been slowly stewing an idea that you didn't want to unmute yourself and talk about, now is your time. Please feel free to submit a suggestion. No suggestion is bad. We, we find that sometimes the quieter folks have the best questions, so please feel free to, to put that in. And then stick around even if you aren't submitting any questions that you have so that you can weigh in on what we spend our time on. We need people other than just the ProSurf team to vote on this, although we will also be voting on it. So, amazing. Um, let me put this up. Great. Seeing some come in and I'm gonna make a quick additional form to put the poll in. Feel free to talk amongst yourself while I do this. Taking these as they come in and feeding them into a new poll. And we'll kick that off in like two minutes. So everyone still has some time to submit. Got a few so far. And on the ProServe side, I know some of you gave some examples. Please submit those too, because I know some people had some plus ones on those while we were talking about it. Another thing that might be worth bringing up is, does anyone have things that they particularly hate in their workflow? I feel like sometimes like it, it's kind of hard to formulate a question of how, of like how to solve a problem, but easy to rant about a workflow that you particularly are tired with and might lead to a good solution or thought around it. Yes, that is like the, I hate building staging models. Let's use code gen. Great example. Translating these, we got a few. Give me one second. Getting close. Ooh. 
great, great, great. Okay, I think, I think we've gathered them all. They kind of are some duplicates. I'm trying to make sure that we get these all into here. All right, last chance before we close this out and then I'm going to send out. Mm. Okie doke, so we are down to kind of, oh, one more just came in. All right, let me send this out so we can all take a vote. I'll make sure it is not set to only Fishtown. <laughs> all righty. So there are five key ideas. One, two, three, four, five, six, five. There are five of them. Um, so if everybody could take that survey, vote for their top option, and then we can go from there. Luckily with some overlap in these, it means it's gonna be pretty easy to see. The results are just flowing in. There's something about a good Google form. Let me share this so that you can all see. Everybody loves a good pie chart, right? Just kidding, nobody does. Wonderful, we'll give a few more minutes, a few more responses in here. Amazing. Great. So basically what's gonna happen from here? Permission, oh no, again, gosh. Sorry about that, everybody. Let me save that. Okay, try again. Is that just the first time people voting? I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, only seven. There are more than seven people on this call. We're like, Sorry we're not about not that, everybody again. We want to work on, and then we all voted for whatever. <laughs> I know <laughs> exactly. All right, you should have access to it now. I'm seeing some more come in. Wonderful. Okay, so what's happening from here? We are going to get these top three results. I don't know if we'll get them. We have a few more minutes, so we'll give another like minute or two. And the people who actually ask these questions, our team's gonna work closely with you to actually figure out how to best solve it. So this might look like scoping out a piece of work and then us kind of working on it for a while and coming back to you with some, hey, does this solve what you're looking for? Hey, can you give us some feedback on this? And then the ultimate goal is these will be presented at Coalesce. So, wow, still have. Just got like 10 more responses in here. So I think it is looking like, let's see, great. It's looking like the reproducibility of results over the long term without snapshotting the entire DAG is the clear winner, followed closely by how to elegantly handle PII data and a playbook for wrangling product experiment data. So we, we will focus on those three projects. And I know that with like the reproducibility of the DAG, several of you waited on that. 
And so this is great because it'll actually be a little bit more collaborative than just us working with one individual company or one person that has this problem. And we can kind of get buy-in to make sure that it kind of accomplishes the questions that Josh was asking and Joel was asking and Andrew was weighing in on and all of those different pieces. Great. Wonderful. Okay, cool. We don't often end 10 whole minutes early. Does anyone have any kind of outstanding questions, thoughts, ideas? All right. Well, thank you all again.